Well, good afternoon, everybody. If we could uh, all take our seats, we'll, uh, we'll start the, uh, the afternoon session. And you're all seated. Good. This, uh, this being the first session after lunch of the middle day, and also realising that many in the audience have come from overseas, so day two or three after a long overseas trip is about the day that jet lag kicks in nicely. I thought what I might do is just to uh, lighten proceedings up a little bit and uh, perhaps give you a little story to uh, set the scene for this afternoon's session. Some time ago, Australia had a fairly serious airline strike. And on that occasion, uh, two mid-30s business people uh, decided that they had to get to Melbourne from Sydney for a conference, much like this one, and that they couldn't avoid travelling. So they went off to the railway station and they bought themselves a couple of tickets. And uh, by the time they got onto the train and presented their tickets to the conductor, the conductor escorted them to their couchette. Now, bearing in mind these two people are total strangers, when they get to the couchette, they realise that the intention of the railway company is that they should both, two total strangers, share a couchette, neither of them having seen each other and obviously of opposite, uh, opposite sexes. And so they said, look, this can't work because we're total strangers and we're not going to share a cabin overnight on the way to Melbourne on this train. And the conductor said, well, look, you've got two options. You either don't go to Melbourne or one of you needs to sit up front in the chairs. And of course, they looked at each other and they both had very important things to do in Melbourne. So there was no point going to a chair because they'd be not getting any sleep. So they looked at each other and said, look, we can make this work. And they agreed that they would share the couchette and they disappeared in their own separate directions until after dinner when the young man comes back to the cabin and uh, he opens the door and the lady is actually in the upstairs bunk, in the top bunk, with her light on reading a book. He moves into the ensuite and brushes his teeth and prepares for bed, puts on his pyjamas, gets into the bottom bunk, turns on his light and starts reading his book. After a short while, um, both lights go off and they start to sleep. And about 15 minutes into this, the top light bunk comes on and the young lady says, are you awake? And the bottom light bunk comes on and he says, yes. And she said, look, could you get me another blanket, please? And he said, look, we're two very healthy young Australians. We're on our way to a conference in Melbourne. We don't know each other and we're probably never going to see each other again. How about just for one night, we pretend we're married? And the young lady goes, oh, all right then. And he says, why don't you get your own blanket? <laughs> now this afternoon's session uh, deals with a very crucial part of our world and one which our own minister referred to many times in his opening address yesterday. What we're here to hear this afternoon is two of our very uh, dear neighbours, uh, Malaysia and Singapore, to present their views on maritime security within that region. The Malacca and Singapore Straits are among the busiest and most critical waterways in the world. With a third of the world's trade and more than half of the world's oil supply carried by some 75,000 vessels transiting the Straits each year. The fundamental issue for the littoral states of the Straits is that the safety of shipping in its total dimensions encompassing issues of security safety and environmental protection. Major economies such as the United States, China, Japan and India all have stakes in ensuring that the safe passage of, of shipping through these straits. There has been much concern over the safety of navigation in the straits, but attention has tended to focus on piracy and robbery at sea. Predominantly, littoral states of the Malacca and Singapore Straits were concerned on the implications of maritime crimes in the states, in the Straits, increasing, increasing shipping traffic and the threats posed to the maritime environment, the high cost of maintaining navigational safety and protecting the environment. Ensuring safe and secure navigation and the care for marine environment are shared responsibilities of the littoral straits of the region, the user states and the shipping industry as well as other stakeholders, many of which are represented in this room. It calls for more effective law enforcement and the maintenance of maritime order. Consequently, the establishment of an effective regime of maritime security, safety and environmental protection in the Straits have received much attention and efforts in recent, in, in efforts in recent years. 
Regional cooperation is an important measure in addressing maritime safety and security. Great cooperation and collaboration among littoral straits in the, in the littoral states in the straits is evident. Nevertheless, managing maritime safety and security in these straits could at times be very challenging as the diverse nature of interests that are involved take play. Hence, the objective of the papers this afternoon is to highlight maritime security and safety issues and challenges in the Malacca and Singapore Straits, existing maritime security and safety cooperation in the Straits, lessons learned and the ways forward. Our first speaker is Admiral Daktuk Mod Amdan from Malaysia. A very impressive record of service, both to his nation and the region, appears in your conference papers, so I won't go into that here. I can add, however, he is a hunter, a fisherman and a chef, and that's probably three very good reasons why he's happily married. Admiral, to you. Thank you very much, Vince, for that kind introduction. By the way, I would like to uh, inform Vince that he has taken four pages of my introductions to these sessions. So can I go to slide five, please? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, maritime cooperation is essential if security and safety of the strait is to be achieved. Prominence on cooperation and agreements among regional agencies in combating maritime crimes and building confidence and trust are vital. Malaysia will continue to nurture and enhance these collaborations and cooperation and recognizes that there is no one mechanism to deal with all threats all the time and there needs to be greater efforts towards maritime domain awareness. It deprives criminals of safe havens, accelerates information sharing and request or response processes, allows burden sharing and sharing of resources, facilitate better supervision of flag state merchant fleets. There are two basic requirements that must be met to achieve effective cooperation. The first one is adequate national capacity and tailored international arrangement, be it bilateral or multilateral. National capacity that the littoral state must possess include the ability to constantly monitor shipping in the streets, the ability to collate and disseminate real-time information, inter-agency cooperations, establish point of contact and communication means, full implementation of ISPS code to reduce risk on board and port areas. While respecting national sovereignty of littoral states, there are numbers of international and regional agreements that can be part of the legal framework for cooperation in the strait. Among others include United Nations Law of the Sea Convention 1982, the Shangri-La Dialogue 2005, Batam Joint Statement 2005, and Jakarta Statement of Enhancement of Safety, Security, and environmental protection in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. Managing maritime safety and security in the Straits has been high on the agenda of regional summits and conferences. The past seven years had seen many initiatives and measures that were put in place towards enhancing safety and security in the Straits by the littoral states, international communities, and the user states. The current cooperative initiatives and measures are outcomes of the Shangri-La Dialogue 2005, Batam Joint Statement 2005, and Jakarta Statement of Enhancement of Safety, Security, and Environmental Protection in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. These three events were significant milestones which have led to the many cooperative momentums in the Straits. Ladies and gentlemen, the maritime security and safety issues in the Straits of Malacca. The littoral states of the Malacca Strait shares a large vested interest in the security and safety in the Strait. Piracy and robbery at sea are of main concern. 
The littoral states are also apprehensive about other transnational crime, specifically illegal immigration, human trafficking, trafficking of arms, drugs, and contraband across the Malacca Strait. Apart from these crimes, the littoral states are equally concerned about the safety of navigation, environmental threats, particularly from shipborne marine pollution, both from the risk of accidental pollution as a result of collisions or grounding, and intentional pollution from tank cleaning. Piracy cooperative countermeasures. With regards to piracy and armed robbery at sea, last seven years had witnessed tremendous decline in the piratical attacks and armed robbery in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. From 38 cases in 2004, the menace of piracy and robbery at sea in the Straits of Malacca has been almost completely eradicated to only two cases in 2009 and one, cases, one case in 2010. The reductions was the outcome of enhanced surveillance and effective enforcement by littoral states and active preventive measures by mariners on board. The littoral states of states should feel proud for their continued and enhanced cooperation, which has directly facilitated in ensuring the overall number of attacks is kept under control. In the case of piracy and robbery in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, Various indigenous and regional measures have been taken at national, bilateral, and multilateral levels, levels with support from international communities and major user states. At the national level, the littoral states of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore have all taken steps to address and mitigate the issue of piracy and robbery at sea by enhancing its navies and law enforcement agencies' capacities establish integrated surveillance and information network, increase patrols and interdictions. There have been efforts at lateral, bilateral cooperation as well among these littoral states. There are bilateral patrols arrangement, coordinated patrols, point of contacts, direct communication links, information sharing, and periodical meetings that have helped seamen greater cooperation. Multilateral responses to piracy and robbery at sea has taken shape and contributed significantly to the overall reductions of piracy and robbery at sea in the Straits. Relevant activities include the Trilateral Malacca Strait Sea Patrol, or the MSSP, and coordinated airborne surveillance under the Ice in the Skies arrangement, and the establishments of regional cooperation agreement on combating piracy and armed robbery against ships or recap. Anti-human smuggling cooperative countermeasures. Human smuggling is a dynamic transnational organized crime. It spans continents, links to organized crime syndicates, and crosses multiple national jurisdictions. These are increasingly controlled by transnational organized crime syndicates, whose smuggling ventures comprises several aspects. Firstly, the recruitment of passengers. Secondly, transfer through the number of transit points prior to boarding vessels to a third country, for example, Australia or Canada. Third, document frauds. And fourthly, post-departure support that include resupply of vessels during the venture and replacement vessels in the event initial vessels become unseaworthy. Human smuggling networks often work with many different human smuggling organizations in order to maintain security, flexibility, and the agility to ensure success and maximum profits. They are normally independent and only responsible to a small portion of the overall smuggling journey. This loose, fluid nature of the network minimizes its vulnerability to law enforcement interdiction. Each of these aspects presents a potential vulnerability for the syndicates and opportunity for the government agencies for the removal of key individuals in the command and control chain that would, that would disrupt the syndicate activity. In recent years, the smuggling of human beings across the Straits of Malacca and Singapore 
has increased significantly. People are smuggled into Malaysia from countries such as Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, and Sri Lanka through the neighboring or source countries and smuggled into Australia, which is one of the final destination country by sea. Since September 2008, there has been a significant increase in the irregular maritime arrival into Australia. From seven suspected irregular entry vessels arrival, or SIEVs, in 2008, to 18 SIEVs arrivals in 2009. Of these 2009 arrivals at the Christmas Island, 464 claims to be Afghans, and 436 are Sri Lankans. Small numbers of Iraqis, Iranians, and Somalis nationals have also been recorded. Combating human smuggling is not an easy task. National responses by a single country are relatively ineffective, as these human smuggling organizations or syndicates are very agile and maintain a very high operational security. Hence, international cooperation is key to dismantling human smuggling activities, especially in four broad areas. Firstly, intelligence or information sharing. Secondly, border control management. Thirdly, law enforcement agencies cooperation. And fourth, capacity building. During top-level talks between Malaysia, Australia, and Australia-Indonesia, has agreed to step up bilateral cooperation in the fight against people smuggling. Australia will continue to work with Indonesia, Malaysia, and other countries in the region to improve border security and migration management, and at the same time, ensure appropriate support for displaced population and resolutions of protected humanitarian situations. Indonesia, Malaysia, and Australia will continue effective regional dialogue to find practical ways to provide assistance and protection to the vulnerable people and reduce the potential for exploitation by people smugglers. At an operational level, the cooperation includes immigration cooperation, customs, border protection, intelligence gathering, and information sharing. Bilateral Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, is already in place to further strengthen efforts in combating human smuggling. Cooperative mechanism in the Malacca Straits for navigation safety and environmental protection. The legal regime covering straits used for international navigation gives much greater weight to the navigational interests of the international community than to the environmental and security interests of the littoral states. These rights of littoral states to regulate ships exercising transit passage are severely restricted. At the same time, littoral states bear heavy burden in the maintenance of navigational safety of ships using such straits. Ensuring open, safe, and secure navigation and the safeguarding the marine environment of the Straits of Malacca and Singapore is a shared responsibility of the three littoral states of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, the user states, the shipping industries, and other stakeholders. Consequently, the setting up of the cooperative mechanism in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore has paved the way to this burden sharing, which embodies cooperation among littoral states, user states, and the stakeholders on a voluntary basis. Cooperative mechanism in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore is unique. Unique because it represents the successful establishment for the first time ever of the type of cooperative mechanism for the management of international state envisaged in Article 43 of the UNCLOS. Additionally, its uniqueness is in the diverse diversity of roles played by various actors, that is, littoral states, IMOs, shipping industries, and volunteers in enhancing safety and environmental protection in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. This cooperative mechanism will provide a regular platform for dialogue between the littoral states, user states, and users of the Straits, as well as structured framework for cooperation with the international community. The mechanism facilitates three, the three littoral states, user states, and users of the Straits to exchange views, jointly undertake projects, 
and make voluntary monetary contribution through the following three components. One, a forum for regular dialogue. Second, a committee to coordinate and manage specific projects. And thirdly, a fund to receive and manage financial contributions. The cooperative mechanism is beginning to get a widespread show of support for the project's aim at enhancing the safety of navigation and environmental protection in the Straits that were first proposed by the littoral states. Under the cooperative mechanism, the three littoral states and user states of the Straits agreed to set up the Aid to Navigation Fund, which will be managed by the littoral states. Under this mechanism, a Projects Coordination Committee, or the PCC, was also set up to oversee the implementations of six projects in the Straits, including the removal of wrecks in the traffic separation scheme in the Straits, cooperations and capacity building on hazardous and noxious substance preparedness and response in the Straits. The committee also would supervise the setting up of tide, current and wind measurement system for the Straits to enhance navigation safety and marine environment protection, replacement and maintenance of aids to navigation in the Straits. The project, those that I have mentioned just now, were widely endorsed by the user states and stakeholders. The progress made in the implementation of Marine Electronic Highway demonstra Demonstration Project for the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, or the MEH Demonstration Project, is a very pleasing indeed and progressing well. What are the lessons learned from all this that I've mentioned? It is heartening to note that the three littoral states are like-minded, open, inclusive, and able to work together. There is a convergence of interest in ensuring piracy, robbery at sea, industry is under control. While these states assert their sovereignty over their littoral seas in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, it is at the same time they recognise the rights and interests of the user state, shipping industries and other stakeholders. Additionally, the three littoral states are committed to uphold and apply relevant international laws in the Straits. As piracy and robbery at sea is a very much a law enforcement issue, currently there are bilateral cooperative mechanisms among littoral states' maritime law enforcement agencies. In the same note, the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agencies, or the MMEA, has hosted a working level meeting in November 2009 to pave ways to establishing multilateral cooperation between MMEA, Singapore Police Coast Guard, and Badan Koordinasi Keamanan Laut, or the Bako Kamla of Indonesia. And lately, Royal Thai Marine Police has been included. There is a parallel between what is happening in the Gulf of Aden and what used to be in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. In the case of Straits of Malacca and Singapore, indigenous and regional measures have been adopted at national, bilateral and multilateral levels with supports from international community. Unlike in the Gulf of Aden, where the responses are only from the international community alone. Littoral states do have a significant role to play in suppressing piracy and robbery at sea. Though practical attacks and robberies are committed on board ships, the causal factors, effective solutions are actually found on shores. Patrols and interdiction at sea may be effective at reducing piracy and robbery at sea, but the reality is that very few offenders are actually caught at sea. Hence, the more effective solution lies in traditional policing onshore, including developing a picture of their modus operandi, investigations of possible links between piracy or robbery at sea and organized crime syndicates, their financial trails, and interdiction of their nests onshores. There is a need to complement border controls by increasing law enforcement efforts to dismantle the human smuggling networks in the country of origin and transit and through enhanced international law enforcement cooperation between the country of destination, the country of transit and the country of origin. There is also a need 
for prosecutors and the judiciary to cooperate across borders to ensure that migrant smugglers are brought to justice in a quick time. Unless the organized crime groups who smuggle people are dismantled, people smugglers will continue to operate and quickly adapt their methods and routes to changing circumstances such as improved border control or changes in the visa regimes. Regional and inter-regional approaches must be fostered as a priority. Without strong cooperation between countries and des of destination, countries of transit, and countries of origin within and between regions, migrant smugglers will continue across borders without meeting any strong cross-border challenges. In many instances, national and bilateral responses to migrant smuggling have only resulted in the displacement of routes to other countries. Cooperative Forum in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore is a milestone breakthrough in the efforts of all parties in enhancing safety and environmental protection through the Straits. The setting up of the mechanism is an opportunity to maintain, even strengthen, the already established channel of communications among all parties concerned, thus facilitating a meaningful dialogue for accomplishment of all objectives set. The three littoral states have been able to work together on improving navigational safety and environmental protection in the Strait through the Tripartite Technical Expert Group, or the TTEG. The three littoral states are open and inclusive with regards to sovereignty and the rights and interests of user states, shipping industries, and other stakeholders. There is shared interest between littoral states and user states in enhancing the navigational safety and environmental protections of the street. International law, especially the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea 1982, has set such a balance. While littoral states are not allowed to obstruct transit passage, neither are flag states exercising the right to the transit passage allowed to threaten the sovereignty, sovereign rights, territorial integrity, and other security, security interests of the littoral state. Thus, the corridor and basis for cooperation has clearly been laid out by the international law. It is also important to set a balance between the interests of different stakeholders, especially different user states. For a long time, Japan was the only user state which was willing to help the littoral state. It is heartening to note, however, that other states such as Australia, China, EU, India, Germany, Greece, Republic of Korea, United Arab Emirates, United States, and international communities such as IMO and the Middle East Navigational Aid Services, or MENAS, have come forward recently in assisting the littoral states. What do I see as a way forward for this gentleman? As a way forward, the following measures are considered desirable. Firstly, the current cooperative arrangement for maritime security be maintained and improve cooperation among the littoral state navies and coast guard to provide prompt response to incident at sea. Next, there should be a continue to address maritime security issue of the Straits of Malacca and Singapore by taking into consideration of all stakeholders' interests. Next one, establishment of multilateral cooperation between MMEA, Singapore Police Guards, Indonesian Marine Police, and Royal Thai Marine Police so as to provide effective policing of the Straits. Next was timely information sharing and real-time operational cooperation between littoral states, law enforcement agencies. This is something which needs to be uh, stressed upon. As it is now, the uh, timely information that we have received from uh, BPCs especially, the Border Protection Command of Australia, has been very, very beneficial for us to, for us to, en to enforce the appropriate uh, measures in the Straits in helping us to curb the problem of uh, people smuggling. Next is to, for con to the conduct of coordinated sea patrols in designated high-risk areas. We have come to understand and we have come to pinpoint several areas in the Straits of Malacca where these activities 
reoccurs from time to time. So we, felt, we feel that the conduct of coordinated sea patrol in these designated areas of these high-risk areas needs to be enhanced all the time. User states and international community must also help to build the taller state maritime enforcement agency's capacity to suppress maritime crimes. Article 43 can be successfully implemented in other states used for international navigation based on the cooperative mechanism in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. It is also envisaged that we must continue to take a comprehensive and inclusive approach to maintain security, safety and environmental protection in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore that also recognizes the interests of all users and stakeholders. Since the littoral state have, pre have presented several projects for adoption and many more to follow, the major user states and interested, interested stakeholders will have to continue to contribute to the revolving fund. The interest of the many countries and organizations to share the burden in the maintenance of navigational aids in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore should be supported and enhanced. It, also, it is also hoped that more contribution to the fund would come from other stakeholders, such as from the shipping industries and oil companies within the context of their CSR or corporate social responsibility, as well as from other environmental groups and international or regional organizations. A balanced emphasis should also be placed on fostering operational relationship between and among littoral states maritime law enforcement agencies to better facilitate law enforcement cooperation as a whole. In conclusion, as global trade continues to grow and shipping traffic increases, the crucial task of maintaining safety, security, and preserving the marine environment in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore grows in tandem. There is therefore the need for continuous and wider cooperation between the littoral states, user states, and other stakeholders of the Straits of Malacca and Singapore to ensure that these vital waterways remain safe and open to traffic. The basis of cooperation in Straits of Malacca and Singapore has clearly been laid out by the international law and international regimes. Therefore, it should be understood that regional cooperation requires reconciling interests of all stakeholders and at the same time recognizing the concern for sensitivity of the littoral state's concern. It is also important to set a balance between the interests of different stakeholders, especially different user states. The positive spirit of cooperation and determination by the littoral states of the Straits of Malacca and Singapore and all stakeholders to tackle maritime security and safety issues is a concerted manner that pervaded the Jakarta meeting has so far borne rich fruits. While at the same time, and in parallel, it contributes substantially towards raising the navigational safety and environmental protection standards. The cooperative mechanism in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore is indeed an excellent model to promote maritime cooperation. I thank you for the audience. Well, Admiral uh, Datuk Amdan, clearly the Maritime Enforcement Agency of Malaysia is in very, very good hands. That was a remarkably refreshing view, which took us well beyond the conventional norms of just worrying about maritime security at sea and encompassing a great deal of other facets that need to be included and considered in the, uh, in the activity if it's going to be successful. Things that really stuck out uh, in my mind, and perhaps we might uh, explore further in question and answer, was uh, notwithstanding the significant reductions in piracy and robbery, which are in themselves remarkable achievements and a really good indication of what can be achieved with good cooperation, some of the sentences that really stuck out in my mind were that there are many facets and elements in the security business. The effective solution in traditional policing ashore as an essential part to play, and to qualify that observation was that very few offenders are caught at sea. There's, uh, there's a huge message in that, and we might explore that a bit further. Also refreshing to see is the corporate social responsibility being mentioned. 
because it's not just a business for navies. That leads us uh, into a partner in this activity, um, one of the three, and that is Singapore. Our second speaker today is, uh, is the chief of Singapore's navy, Admiral Ng Ching Chi Peng. He has a most enviable record of operational experience, academic achievement, and staff appointments, again, all which I urge you to read in the, in the, uh, in the conference papers. It's made all the more impressive by a very clear and evident maintenance of a very youthful disposition. Um, clearly, his hobbies help in this regard. He is a keen golfer, runner, a swimmer, and he too is also very happily married. Sir. Thanks, Vince, for that uh, introduction. Vice Admiral Ray Griggs, Chief of Navy, RAN, fellow Navy Chiefs, heads of delegation, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank Emma Griggs and the RAN for inviting me to speak with you. I'm delighted to be here in Australia and to be able to share with you some of my thoughts on maritime security cooperation. Speakers yesterday have highlighted the critical importance of maritime trade in the global economy. Let me underscore this with some figures. Transportation of freight by sea is estimated to be about 10 times cheaper than via rail, 45 times cheaper than via road, and 163 times cheaper than via the air. It's unsurprising, therefore, that 80% of world trade is today transported by the sea, from the clothes that we wear to the fuel that powers our vehicles, vessels, and factories. These basic necessities of life have, are largely brought to us by seaborne trade. As the world economy becomes increasingly interconnected, any disruption to the maritime commerce routes would have severe consequences. Such disruption to the sea lines of communications in a particular region will have ramifications that will ripple through the international community. A major threat to seaborne trade is piracy. It's estimated that piracy costs the world economy some seven to 12 billion dollars every year. Over the past few years, the Gulf of Aden has been put in the international limelight due to the burgeoning piracy problem. Ship insurance premiums have risen there alongside fuel costs from rerouting and security equipment expenses, all adding to a considerable rise in the cost of trade. Beyond piracy, we face a wide spectrum of other maritime threats and challenges, including maritime terrorism and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. These maritime security challenges transcend national boundaries, and no single country has the bandwidth or the resources to address them alone. On 28th of July, 2010, M-Star, a Japanese supertanker, encountered a terrorist attack from a boat laden with, with explosives while transiting the Straits of Hormuz. A militant group known as the Brigades of Abdullah Azman, which has links to the Al-Qaeda, claimed responsibility for the attack. Terrorist groups like the Brigades of Abdullah Azam do not respect boundaries or territories. The brand of terrorism padded by Al-Qaeda and its network of affiliates are not confined to one part of the world, nor is any country immune to their attacks. Just as Al-Qaeda shares information and resources with its affiliates around the globe, maritime security forces around the world cannot afford to operate in isolation. As the sea knows no bounds, so must the barriers that impede our cooperation be brought down. As an island nation, 
Maritime security cooperation is fundamental to Singapore. The Singapore Armed Forces contributes actively to the counter-piracy efforts in the Gulf of Aden. Since 2009, the SAF has helmed the Combined Task Force 151 twice and deployed three task groups to the Gulf of Aden, each consisting of a landing ship tank and two helicopters. We also deployed a maritime patrol aircraft detachment to the Gulf of Aden to perform maritime surveillance operations from April to July last year. These deployments, together with our experience in the Malacca and Singapore Straits, have allowed us to discern three key success factors that we believe are essential to enhancing maritime security, not just in the Gulf of Aden and in the Southeast Asia, but also beyond. First, fostering mutual understanding and trust. Second, establishing collaborative information sharing networks. And third, building interoperability and capacity to collaborate. Let me elaborate. Fostering mutual understanding and trust is a necessary first step in establishing any cooperative maritime framework. This can be built through regular exchanges and interactions between the partner countries and agencies at the strategic as well as the operational levels. It is with mutual understanding and trust that we can take concrete actions and effective practical measures to tackle maritime security challenges together. Opportunities must therefore be identified and created for stakeholders to confer on a regular basis at both the strategic and operational levels to establish this trust. The next key success factor is establishing collaborative information sharing networks. There's a growing realization among stakeholders of its compelling value proposition. Information sharing contributes to comprehensive maritime awareness. It enables operational responses to be employed effectively to enhance maritime security and safety, provided, of course, that the partners are able and willing to share information. To enable and enhance partners' ability to share, robust command and control information systems or CCIS networks need to be put in place to allow rapid dissemination of information to kill ground operation actions. To enhance the willingness to share, the ingredient of mutual trust and understanding is key. This leads me to the third key success factor of building interoperability and capacity to collaborate. This success factor is about putting words, dialogues, and discussions into practice and working out the nuts and bolts of operating together. It can be established through bilateral, multilateral, and multi-agency interactions and exercises to build familiarity and interoperability. This is crucial to enable forces from different countries and different agencies to orchestrate an effective joint operational response when the need arises. I'll now talk a bit about how these success factors have contributed to enhancing maritime security cooperation in Southeast Asia. On the first factor, countries in Southeast Asia recognize that mutual understanding and trust are needed at both the strategic and operational levels. In our region, forums such as the ASEAN Defence Ministers' Meeting, the ADMM, and the ADMM Plus, the Shangri-La Dialogue, the ASEAN Navy Chiefs' Meeting, and the Malacca Strait Patrol's Joint Coordinating Meetings have helped build up mutual understanding and trust amongst the Defence Ministers, the Navy Chiefs, right down 
to the operational commanders. Each of these forums has a unique role and agenda from building strategic confidence, fostering practical cooperation and collaboration, down to ironing out of operational details. But the important thing is that the fundamental principles that underpin these forums are similar and include the commitment to open and inclusive dialogue, mutual respect, and resolving differences peacefully and in accordance to international law. These guiding principles have provided a strong basis for sustainable trust and cooperation. Moving forward, we would need to identify, continue to identify opportunities to bring together stakeholders in the region to confer on a regular basis, to build strategic confidence, simulate sharing of best practices and operational information, raise awareness on regional maritime security threats, develop effective operational responses and collective measures, as well as identify and close operational gaps. On the second success factor, we are seeing the healthy emergence and growth of information sharing centres and maritime operational coordination agencies in the region in recent years. Singapore's Information Fusion Centre, Indonesia's Bako Kamla Crisis Centre, Malaysia's MMEA, Brunei's Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, the Philippines Maritime Research Information Center, are some examples of maritime security centers in the region. These establishments are key building blocks for a region-wide collaborative information sharing framework, or what I would term as a network of networks that is taking shape. To this end, within ASEAN, we are already taking concrete steps to operationalize this network of networks. At the ASEAN Navy Chiefs meeting held in Hanoi in July last year, the ASEAN Navy Chiefs approved for the ASEAN Information Sharing Portal, or the AIP, to be used as the platform for information sharing within the ASEAN region. The AIP is a seamless portal that connects all the information fusion and operation center in ASEAN so as to enhance information sharing and sense making, as well as to enable efficient coordination of regional operational responses. The AIP will also enable the regional operational commanders to be connected on a 24-7 basis to discuss best practices and coordinate a whole of region response against maritime threats at the operational level as required. The Indonesian and Singapore navies co-organized the first workshop to train the regional maritime practitioners on the usage of the AIP in November last year, and we are on track to fully operationalize the AIP during the inaugural ASEAN information sharing exercise in the middle of this year. Beyond information sharing and ops coordination, we can also seek to experiment and share new tools of sense-making and collaboration on the portal, ensuring that the portal is effective and current and that the benefits of enhanced information sharing are shared and proliferated to every member country. The benefits of information sharing can be reaped beyond Southeast Asia. This is illustrated in the operational response to the hijacking of the Indonesian flag MV Sinakudus off the coast of Somalia in March last year. Upon receiving the hijack alert from MV Sinakudus, the UK Maritime Trade Office, the UK MTO, shared the real-time location of the vessel with the operational forces 
operating in the Gulf of Aden and with Singapore's Information Fusion Center, which subsequently passed this information to our Indonesian friends. Leveraging on this information sharing framework, the Indonesian Navy swiftly deployed two frigates and a support ship into the Gulf of Aden and were able to maintain continuous surveillance of MV Sinakudus before escorting the ship to a safe location upon her release from the pirates. This example highlights the importance of establishing information sharing linkages, as well as the need to keep expanding this network of networks to support our operational forces. On the third success factor of building interoperability, initiatives such as the Western Pacific Naval Symposium Maritime Security Exercises, the Maritime Information Sharing Exercises, the annual Southeast Asia Cooperation Against Terrorism or CCAT series of exercises, and the FPDA or Five Power Defense Arrangement series of exercises have brought together regional and international partners to operate together based on a common set of techniques, tactics, and procedures. This include exercising the information sharing and sense-making processes, as well as validating the linkages between various operation centers and command teams in responding to a spectrum of maritime security threats. Such practical cooperation reinforces dialogues in building not just strategic confidence, but also personal ties and interoperability amongst our ground forces. When faced with maritime threats, such as piracy or terrorism, this interoperability amongst our regional naval forces translates to effective operational ground responses. And this is one of the key factors behind the operational successes of the Malacca Strait coordinated patrols. In conclusion, we would need to build on these key success factors to enhance maritime security cooperation in an increasingly interconnected world. The transboundary nature of maritime security threats require a cooperative and collaborative international response. The tenets of fostering mutual understanding and trust, establishing collaborative information sharing networks, and the building of interoperability and capacity to collaborate are key cornerstones for success in tackling the complex and evolving maritime threats. Together, we can make our seas safe and secure for all. Thank you. Rather than uh, try and sum that up, I'd like to first say thank you very much, Admiral Ong. But could we just have that last slide back up? Isn't that one of the most impressive pictures you've ever seen? Now, I don't think there's too many navies big enough in the world to inspect every one of those if they had to, even at anchor. It's quite an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary amplification of the Admiral's message that unless you're cooperating and getting as many of the resources that you can to bear to work together, then it's pointless trying to think that we could all get to even a half of just that particular second in history. But anyway, having said that, it's now uh, our opportunity to, uh, to pick the brains of, uh, of both these very, uh, very fine gentlemen and, uh, and, and their presentations this afternoon. And I would hope that they've given enough uh, hooks in their presentations to, to people in the audience to, uh, to ask some, uh, some interesting and perhaps not necessarily all the way on centre questions about navies alone, because both spoke very much about the whole maritime security picture and what it takes to make it work if it's to be effective. And they've taken it to a part of the world where it needs to be effective if world trade is not going to be disrupted. So with that in mind, um, we've got a few rules of engagement here. I think there's four microphones set up, is that right? Help us out here, guys. OK, we've got them. All right, so uh, can I ask if you have a question to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make? Please stand, get yourselves to the uh, microphone, identify yourselves and who you're directing the question to. And uh, do we have any questions?
All right, well, where, where is that? Ah, there's one. Please. Uh, good, after good afternoon. Sir. Is that on? Yep. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my question is for either Admiral uh, Duthuk or Admiral Peng. One of the issues we've seen in the Gulf of Aden, particularly with piracy, is a nation's willingness to actually prosecute and then uh, a jail, if you like, and then what to do with the pirates once you've done that. Has the trilateral arrangement uh, made any agreement on how to prosecute pirates uh, within the Straits of Malacca? Thank you uh, for the question. <clears throat> I think we had uh, three examples that we can, uh, we can make uh, with respect to prosecution of uh, so-called piracy. I, I wouldn't like to use the word piracy, especially in the Straits of Malacca. It's more to high seas robberies. And we had three cases which we dealt with swiftly, and that has caught the attentions of a lot of other um, perspective perpetrators who intend to do the same. And I find it is a very uh, a unique thing which can actually put a, a good deterrence if we really prosecute them quickly and impose the penalties and execute uh, what has been given by the court uh, immediately. The three cases are two in the, uh, in the Straits of Johor and Singapore and one cases in the Straits of Malacca, where we dealt with these cases within 19 days of apprehension. We, uh, we do the uh, investigation, we prosecute them in court, and within 19 days, all the three groups were given uh, 10 years of uh, imprisonment plus 10 lashes, which has sent a very strong message to those people on the ground who intend to do the same kind of activities in the Straits of Malacca. And I find that it is something that means must be done continuously. You don't deal with any situation where you prolong things up to one year, two years. That does not impact, does not give any great impact to those people who have the intention, the bad intention of doing things. But if you do that within a short period of time, I think that will give a great impact. Uh, we don't have any special arrangement within our the three countries, the littoral state, between Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia, for that matter. But uh, the three cases that I mentioned just now was cases handled by Malaysia. I'm not sure about Singapore, sir. Just to add, just to add on to what Dato Amdan uh, is saying, I, there's a key difference between the Gulf of Aden and the Strait of Malacca and Singapore. Uh, and we are fortunate that we have strong states in our part of the world um, that have robust legal regimes and enforcement agencies that can prosecute um, any perpetrators, perpetrators out there that we catch and bring them to a legal finish. That's important. It sends a very strong deterrent message and also deals effectively with the people that uh, are captured. That's a key difference. Whereas in the Gulf of Aden, you lack such a, a regime and the states that can prosecute, which is why you have issues of what you do with the pirates thereafter. Because I think the recognition is out there that the, while the maritime forces are addressing the symptoms of the problem out at sea, the causes of the, the symptoms of piracy and so forth, the root of the solution will have to be on land. And that's where you need the, the strong legal regime, the strong states to be able to have that follow through to make sure that the problem doesn't go back out to sea again. Thank you very much. I, I, would, like to, uh, I would like to further elaborate what uh, Admiral Ng was mentioning just now with regards to following it up on land. Uh, we also had a few cases where the information that we gained with regards to the ransoms, demanded, that kind of things. And we, they were even, they even dared to tell us which account to, to remit the monies into. So this kind of information, even though it seems to be very little information, we sent to our counterpart in the next country. And uh, within two weeks after that, that people on the other side was apprehended. 
So it shows how great collaboration between the two countries that can help each other in eradicating all these uh, problems. Yeah, I'd like to thank um, both admirals for their excellent remarks. I have a question for Admiral Peng. Um, in your ASEAN information portal, what are your uh, largest um, challenges in, um, in taking your data and converting it into uh, predictive uh, models to help um, use your limited assets best? Um, OK, I'm just trying to just drill down to uh, the specifics of what you're asking. The tech, your, your concern about the challenges, uh, well, technical challenges I don't think is, is what you're asking for. Technical challenges, I think those are things that uh, we can deal with uh, in terms of being able to build uh, an information portal, uh, internet protocol base and so forth. Yeah, operational, operational challenges. Operational challenges, um, well, the factors that we mentioned um, earlier, some of the information um, are sensitive, so there has to be certain understanding uh, and trust amongst all the partners that certain information out there will have to be shared among everybody uh, and that those information, if there are certain uh, restrictions on those, uh, then we will have to work on them judiciously and be able to um, come to some form of uh, agreement on what can be on the IIP and what should not be on the AIP. Um, but those are issues that, by and large, we are able to work out um, through years of operating together, uh, and we have a certain sense of understanding among all the agencies what are the things that we ought to be out there and what are the things that shouldn't be out there. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Sorry about that, the sun's pretty bright in here. Thanks. Hi, my question's to uh, either of you. I was just wondering, with your uh, security cooperation agreements, whether you'd address the issue of uh, following a vessel into a neighbouring country's territorial waters? Uh, as it is now, we don't have any problem with that. <laughs> uh, the cooperative mechanism that we have established in, 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 in this region between the three states has clearly indicated our willingness to work together. I quote a very recent happening uh, whereby uh, one of the tugboats and the barges was uh, commanded by a group of seven peoples. And on pursuing this barge and boats, this barge enters Indonesian waters in which there is no agreement between Malaysia and Indonesia for uh, hot pursuit. There's no agreement between us. So what we immediately do was just pick up the red phone. We call up the head of a Bako Kamla on the other side in, in Jakarta. I am pursuing a ship which has positively been identified, being commanded by a group of people entering your waters now. Can I have immediate permission from you to enter your water to prosecute? Yes, you can do it. So we did, we did that. And our navies went into and prosecuted the thing, and they, they apprehend the, uh, the vessel seven miles inside Indonesian waters. So that shows how, how fast, how collaborative form of uh, understanding can be worked out between the neighboring little states. So we don't have any problem of crossing. Uh, it's just a matter of asking permission and the understanding is there. I just just want to add to that. Um, this is where the factor that I mentioned of mutual understanding and trust is, is critical. It's also similar to the question that was asked on the AIP. You need to have that mutual understanding and trust for this operational co collaborative and cooperative frameworks to be successful. Uh, and that's something that you have to build over time, over the years, and through regular interactions, so that when things happen, you can pick up the phone and know who is on the other side, know who you're talking to, and you can get certain things done. 
you need that understanding and trust. Um, you can build all the um, CCIS, the information systems and so forth, but the key ingredient is that trust and understanding to be able to optimize it and maximize the systems. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one for you, uh, and, and either, either could answer, I hope. What do you think is the most logical size of achievable space on the globe to achieve maritime security? In other words, should this be done regionally? Is it possible globally? Is there some sense that you, either of you have as to what the maximum number of, of participants is actually optimum? Um, I think you have uh, models that are regional as well as models that are quite global in nature. And in practice, um, mod such models, whether it's global or regional, have worked well. The Magnus Straits um, Coordinated Patrols is uh, an example of a model on a regional scale. I would say that uh, the Gulf of Aden is quite a global model of cooperation where you have not just the CMF, um, you have the NATO forces, you have the EU uh, NAV forces, you have independent deployers, all in a particular part of the world, solving a common problem, but coming across from every part of the world. And that's, I would say, you know, it's, it's more of a, a global model of cooperation, not just a, a regional, uh, littoral-based type of model. So I think whatever um, models that we may have in place, what is important is what is effective for that circumstance and for that particular region and time. If it works, it works. I, uh, I particularly agreed with uh, what Admiral Ernst was saying. Uh, we, we don't really actually look at a model to, to really fix ourselves into doing things according to that model, according to this model. No. What I personally feel is that if it works in your area, you need to establish whatever networking, whatever kind of uh, collaborative work, be it military co collaboration, be it law enforcement collaboration, be it whatever things that needs to be done at that time, we do it. Uh, for example, in the Straits of Malacca now, we have so many collaborative work, military collaborative works in terms of MSSP, Malacca Strait Sea Patrol, we have Ice in the Sky program, which is also biomilitary. But at the same time, I'm establishing now on the law enforcement side another cooperative work uh, to be applied between uh, Singapore and Indonesia. So whatever, feel, whatever things that we feel that it must be done, it should be carried out and it should be uh, on, on, on the uh, receiving end by the, our, our partners on the other side. They should be agreeing to it. So we mutually agree to a certain thing that we must do together. One may profess, um, probably in the military perspective, another group is in the uh, enforcement law, enforcement perspective. So we look at every possible ways to make sure there is no loopholes that the perpetrators can use to penetrate the countries, be it smuggling activities, be it uh, drug smuggling or people smuggling or illegal fishing. We work together. So from it, it is all the time that we think of new things what we should do together. But the third most important thing is do it together. Don't do it alone on your own. This is what I'm thinking. Thank and you. And I, I would say that uh, you, you don't need to set out uh, with a, a vision of uh, saying that you want to have a certain model. You have to evolve it along the way. The cooperation that we have in the Strait of Singapore and Malacca uh, is something that has taken many years to develop. Um, you, you have seen the figures that Tato Amdan has shown from 2003 to uh, 2011. Uh, the, the piracy figures um, have gone up to uh, at a peak in 2004 and, and gone down uh, based on the cooperation. When we were in the point of 2004, that was a really critical period. Um, Lloyds declared uh, the Strait of Malacca to be a worry zone absolutely escalated the insurance premiums. 
that brought the countries together to work together. Uh, and it's from then that you have many cooperative mechanisms that were put in place because of the um, understanding uh, that was being built at that time through strategic forums, through operational meetings. Um, an example would be the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, in 2005. That was quite a milestone um, where certain principles for maritime security cooperation uh, were reached, a broad consensus were reached on um, three key principles. The first is that the primary responsibility for maritime security lies with the littoral states. The second is that the international community and major users of such waterways also have a role to play. And the third principle is that any measures and initiative that you implement for maritime security must be in accordance with international law. These principles were very important to set that strategic confidence, that strategic mutual understanding and trust amongst all the littoral states as well as the user states so that the operational measures, the operational nuts and bolts can then be worked up to develop the responses. And that's when you have the information sharing networks that start building up, the ice in the skies patrols that was uh, mooted by uh, then Defence Minister Najib. Those things started taking root. It's a very long process that took many years, but you need time to establish that level of understanding and trust. Thank you. Do we have any other, uh, other questions? Okay, well, rather than um, try to make the last uh, six minutes, I think we've certainly got our money's worth out of, uh, out of these two wonderful papers. Um, we started off the, uh, the session talking about getting your own blanket. Um, I think what we've seen here is that uh, when there's a will, the way is not all that difficult, and uh, getting the most out of it to achieve what is a benefit for all uh, on the high seas, and in particular to keeping those, uh, those trade routes and the sea lines of communication open uh, is, is more than achievable. It's actually, it, it, it brings very, very positive results. Can I please, uh, on your behalf, thank uh, both um, uh, Admiral Umden and, uh, and Admiral Ng for their time this afternoon. We've, uh, we've been given, I think, a tour de force and a very candid uh, view of what is achievable and what is living practice uh, in the very region in which we live. From a personal note, I look very much uh, to being in your country next, uh, next week, Admiral, for the second ADMM Plus Expert Working Group on Maritime Security. And there is much work that we can do and certainly much that we can learn as we evolve that particular group even further to, uh, to see what the uh, art of the possible is in terms of regional cooperation and activity through exercising, desktopping and getting that trust going amongst all, uh, all players. Can I please ask all of you to acknowledge uh, the fine work of uh, these gentlemen today.